Okay. So yes, welcome. Halloween week and we're here to discuss horror fans and audiences. I'm very excited for this discussion. Um, for those of you who haven't been to one of our events before, um, we are the BAFTS, B-A-F-T-S-S, -S, I had to think about that, <laughs> BAFTS Horror Studies um, Subject Interest Group. Uh, and if you don't follow us, um, already and haven't been to some of our events before. We host these events regularly on various different topics about horror, film, television and screen subjects. Um, so I'll post our socials in the in the chat so you can follow us if you aren't already. Um, and as I say, we organise monthly events and our next event takes place um, at the end of November, which we'll be releasing information about soon. Um, but that will be a special anniversary celebration of Alison Pierce's Women Make women make horror sorry with um with a very special guest so keep your eyes peeled for that one should be very exciting We're looking forward to it um just a, a quick bit of housekeeping if i could just ask people to keep their microphones and their cameras off um you can absolutely feel free to use the chat to chat <laughs> that's what it's there for and it's always nice to see people engaging with the discussion so please do feel free to chat along in in the chat um, but if i could just ask you to keep hold of any questions that you might have for the panel until stacy gives you the thumbs up to post them in there. It just makes things easier for Stacey as chair to, to spot them. Um, and she'll do that in about 45 minutes or so, I'm sure. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna clear off in a moment, but before I do that, I'd just like to introduce Stacey Abbott. Um, Stacey uh, is a, 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 a SIG founding member and, and has taken part in many of our events and we're always very thrilled that she agrees to, to join us because she's fantastic. Um, Stacey obviously has written many books on horror film and television, um, including the excellent recent BFI classic Near Dark and is currently working on animated horror and on women in horror television. So lots of new projects on the horizon, which is very exciting. So welcome, Stacey. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so I'm much. Happy. Um, as always, I am delighted to take part in these BAFTS Horror SIG events, um, and I'm really looking forward to chairing this event. Um, so to get us going, I wanted to start off by saying that as a group, um, we have agreed that it seemed appropriate, given the topic, um, to dedicate tonight's session to um, the Dealer, dearly departed Martin Barker, who in his memory, as he has clearly um, been a major influence on many of the people on this panel, I think many of people um, in the discipline, um, and whether you knew him or not, I think it's hard not to have been touched by his work at some point or other um, in the whole area of audience research, but also film and television studies more broadly. So we're really um, pleased that we can to run this event in his memory. So um, bear that in mind as we go on. Um, so um, to begin with, what I'd like to do is I'm going to introduce our panel and invite them to turn their cameras on. And then I've got a series of questions to get started with. And then as Laura said, I will open this up to questions from you. So think about the questions um, as we go and I'll, I'll give you I'll let people know when it's time to put questions. So um, I'm going to introduce each of the speakers um, just to give you a bit of who they are and then I'll start off with some broad opening questions. So I'm really pleased I think we have an outstanding panel tonight. Um, so I'm going through this alphabetically. <laughs> so um, I'm really pleased to welcome Kate Egan, who is an assistant professor in film and media at Northumbria University. She's the author of Trash or Treasure, Censorship and the Changing Meanings of the Video Nasties, Cultographies, the Evil Dead, and co-author of Alien Audiences. She's also the co-editor of Cult Film Stardom, Crit Critical Approaches to Monty Python, researching historical screen audiences and with James Rendell, the forthcoming researching horror fans and audiences in the 21st century. And obviously she's also one of the co-founders of this particular SIG. Um, alongside Kate, we have Matt Hills, professor of media and film at the University of Huddersfield. His work on fandom goes back to the book, Fan Cultures and horror fandom is a key part of his monograph on the pleasures of horror. He's continued to work on both fandom and horror across his career in various ways, addressing TV horror via Doctor Who, for example, in the triumph of the time of a Time Lord. And his most recent relevant work has looked at fans of Black Mirror, 
and Stranger Things fandom. Alongside Matt, we have uh, Bethan Jones. Bethan Jones, sorry, I can't speak tonight, is a research associate at the University of York. She's written extensively about fandom and media tourism and participatory cultures and is co-editor of Crowdfunding, the Future uh, Media Industries, Ethics and Digital Society. Um, and she's also a co-editor of the forthcoming Participatory Culture Wars, Controversy, Conflict and Complicity in Fandom. Bethan is on the board of the Fan Studies Networks, co-chair of the SCMS Fan and Audience Studies Scholarly Interest Group, and one of the incoming editorial team for the journal Popular Communication. It's an impressive group. Um, next, we have James Rendell is a lecturer in creative industries at the University of South Wales. His work predominantly focuses on audience responses to media and their meaning making practices with a particular focus on horror. His research has been published in transformative work, works and cultures, East Asian journal, popular culture, participations, convergence and global TV horror. Um, his forthcoming monograph, Transmedia Terrors in Post-TV Horror, Digital Distribution, Abject Spectrums and Participatory Culture is to be published with Amsterdam University Press. And last but not least, we have Pete Turner, a senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University, where he teaches on the film, digital media production uh, and media communications and culture courses. He's the author of Found Footage Horror Films, A Cognitive Approach, and a monograph on the Blair Witch Project as part of the Auteur Devil's Advocate series. So we have you know, an outstanding panel of people to uh, talk to us tonight about audiences and fans of horror. Um, to begin with, though, I thought, as I mentioned in the bios, that um, Kate and James are in the process of editing a book on researching horror fans and audiences in the 21st century. So I thought it would be good to start with asking uh, both Kate and James to maybe step forward a bit to talk a little bit what prompted you to develop this project now. You know, where did this come from and why now? And I'm happy for either Kate and Jay or James to jump in first. James, what do you think? Do you want to go first or shall I? I mean, you, you were the you were the originator of this idea, weren't you, in the first place? So yeah. it came from you originally. So I reached out to Kate because, as her bio kind of suggests, that, you know, she is a leader in, in horror audience research. Um, but the idea came about um, really thinking about the work that the Participation Journal was doing, and again, sort of harking back to, to Martin Barger's work um, and to Matt's book, Pleasures of Horror, um, and just not finding much else. Or there would be sporadic publications around horror fandom. And, you know, you'd, you'd go to things um, like the Fear 2000 conference or you, we'd come to one of these horror sigs and I was always um, found it so interesting, the commentaries that people would be talking about. People would be talking about their relationships with these films um, as fans, as audience members. Um, and I just felt that there was, there's, it's, fan studies is very rich in sort of the things that it does about different participatory cultures um, and horror studies um, can often talk about audiences, um, but perhaps not empirically. Um, so I felt like there was there was something there where we're trying to capture, um, at least in part, the, the breadth and depth of, of horror fandom and horror audiences as well. Um, Kate, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I mean, sort of picking up on that, and this is something I've always been very conscious of and, and have discussed with various fan study scholars over the years, is this, I know, Stacey, this is something you were going to ask us about a, a little bit later, but it, I think it does relate to... to the, why I was interested in getting involved in this collection with working with James was obviously one reason. Um, another was the fact that I think you know there was there's clearly a lot of work going on in fan studies um, relating to horror or, or some of that work, uh, not least James's work, um, and obviously Matt's work and Bethan's work. We've got you know representatives um, on the panel tonight of people who who do that kind of work. And then there's also work that's starting to emerge within, I guess, more broadly, film and television studies, uh, particularly, you know, I think Pete and I perhaps represent this work that's going on in kind of historical audience research with memory studies, uh, looking at horror from that perspective. And I think, you know, this book hopefully will allow us to bridge those two areas and, and, and for the, you know, the insights that are emerging from those areas to kind of benefit all of us within horror studies. 
So I know that was one of the key reasons why I wanted to get involved in, and, and edit the book with James. And also to sort of build on what James was saying about horror studies and, and a kind of the state of discipline and, and so on. I mean, I'd like to think that um, uh, things like this SIG and our sister SIG in, in SEMS, the horror study SIG there, and something like Fear 2000 as well, are all kind of indicative of almost this kind of new surge of scholarship uh, in horror studies. And obviously there's a lot of PhD students um, uh, around the UK, beyond the UK as well, conducting you know, really exciting new research into horror. Um, I think, you know, we, Laura mentioned it earlier, that a kind of, um, in a way, touchstone text, I think, for that new scholarship that's inspired a lot of young scholars is a book we mentioned earlier, Alison Pierce's book, Women Make Horror, I would argue, which was the, the, the first event uh, for the Bass Horror Sig focused on, on that book and its launch when it came out. And I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Alison, but I, I think she would agree that kind of challenging the, the, the supposed kind of white male dominance of horror is as much about looking at cultures of consumption and audience cultures as it is looking at cultures of production and filmmakers. That if we want to actually explore the diversity of horror as an area of culture, that we need to think about the people that are receiving and consuming and interacting with horror as much as we're thinking about the people who are making it. So I think that that was something that that I felt was really important uh, in terms of this book and and if you like pub and publish it, hopefully fingers crossed uh, we're going to publish it as part of um, the book series that has come out come out of Fear Two Thousand on contemporary horror. So it, hopefully it will mean that audience studies, fan studies uh, has got its place there in as part of this new surge of scholarship on horror. I think, and I think it, it needs to be there. It, it, it's places deserved. Yeah, would argue. Yeah, excellent. That's uh, no, I think absolutely, and it's really um, convincing. It's really exciting to see this book, and I'm really excited to see it. When I first saw the call for papers, I was I was so thrilled to see that some you were doing this. Um, and in preparation for this um, panel, I got a sneak peek at some of the proposals. Um, and it looks really kind of exciting. And without spoiling too much, I wondered if you or James wanted to come on it. Were there anything that surprised you? Like people coming in, like, I think you had a good response. Were there different approaches or anything that kind of you thought, oh, that's kind of, you hadn't anticipated um, in terms of proposals? I think one of the things that's been so lovely about it, um, A, was the positive feedback when the call for papers went out. So even people that weren't necessarily submitting were saying, oh, this sounds really exciting. This was something I would like to read or engage yeah. with. Um, we had a wealth of submissions, which is always lovely. Um, and just the variety, um, both in terms of really kind of showcasing the different types of horror fans that they aren't they aren't one dimensional which is I think something fan studies has always tried to sort of do is trying to highlight the, the myriad types of fans and practices they do um, the range of identities and how identity um, so one of the things we talk about is fans and audiences um, and, and different audience identities that were shaping their engagement or responses to horror, whether that be as a, a fan or an anti-fan, sort of challenging perhaps the fan space or the representations. Um, and, and also also the methodologies. Um, you know, we had a whole diverse range of ways that people are appro uh, approaching this. Um, some of them perhaps more conventional in terms of, of say interviews and surveys, um, but people looking at um, sort of uh, participatory practices the sort of fan creations um and yeah so that was that was really it, it kind of ticked all the boxes in those for me anyway in kind of those kind of things and that's really exciting I think to, to be able to read and, and cover those things great thank you um Kate did you want to add anything to that no I well I was gonna I was gonna mention a specific paper yeah. Um, so just absolutely agreeing with with James there that, that you know, we were really amazed by the, the diverse range of papers, the diverse range of methodologies, and particularly the substantial number of abstracts that were aiming to explore perhaps audiences that had been hidden or fan groups that had been hidden in some ways or marginalised. 
So we've, we've got a really interesting chapter on bloods or black nudes, so black horror podcasters and exploring the intersectional identity as black horror fans and nudes and aficionados of horror. And, and, and that is just one of many examples. We've, we've got um, work that's looking at queer audiences um, and, and looking at you know, gender identities in relation to horror. But we, we also had, and I'm going to mention it specifically because obviously this person is very important to thinking about horror and fans and audiences, and that's Bridget Cherry. So Bridget Cherry's paper is an ethnographic study of Super Sock Scarefest, <laughs> um, which is an annual event um, which takes place on a social media site devoted to knitting, crochet and other handicrafts. So this is obviously building on work that Bridget Cherry's already done um, on uh, broad, more broadly on kind of cult fandom and knitting and textiles. And she's, she's going to do this ethnographic study of Scarefest where um, audiences knit socks uh, that have been designed, uh, they're inspired by um, different kinds of horror film and television, and they knit them as they watch films, and, it, and it's an online festival. And I think, you know, I mean, it, it's fascinating, but I think what it draws attention to is not only the kind of the material cultures, which obviously are par and the paratextual materials as well, so how those play an enormous part in, in exploring horror fandom and, and horror spectatorship. But also that what she's trying to do is actually look at horror fan cultures that are perhaps less conventional or less publicly visible, you know, uh, uh, film festivals and, and online communities. She's, she's actually looking at something that's that's it's been going since 2008, but probably not that many people are aware of it. So I think kind of uncovering those Kind of hidden cultures of horror yeah. is something the collection's trying to do as well yeah no that's great i have to say i was particularly excited by that one i um heard her give a paper on vampire knitting once and it was very exciting so yeah that's exactly it it, it looks really you know like a dynamic collection um uh, again this is sort of for um kate and james but um yeah i'm, I'm also opening up to the panel um you know, the book and this roundtable is specifically referring to fans and audiences. And, you know, they're obviously interrelated areas of research, but they're also quite different. Um, and I wondered, you know, why that distinction between fans and audiences um, or how is it important with regards to studying horror? I mean, is there is there a particular value to separating out thinking about audiences and horror? And I don't know if maybe um, Kate wants to start. Oh, I mean, it's such a thorny uh, issue, isn't it? it? It really is. And I don't know if, if I've got a definitive response to that, Stacey, <laughs> but maybe right. I can get things off. I'd really like to hear what others have got to say okay. on, on this. I know. Um, yeah. Go on. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I've always struggled in terms of my own identity as a scholar, whether I consider myself somebody who's who's kind of embedded within fan studies or not. And to some extent, I, I, I'm not, I'm sort of somebody who does audience research slightly outside of fan studies, even though I, I, I absolutely engage and interact with it and, 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 and keep up to date with its scholarship. Um, but in terms of separating the two, it's tricky, but I guess the key way in which we can separate them is, is, is thinking about casual forms of audiencing or being an audience member where you're, you're somebody, you know, I'm quite fascinated with the way in which horror might kind of weave its way through people's lives and um, might be important to people for lots and lots of reasons that might relate to people, places, experiences that they've had, but they wouldn't necessarily consider themselves to be a horror fan or, or you know, self-identify as such, even though they've clearly got some kind of meaningful relationship of some kind with horror. So, so that idea of horror permeating people's lives in some way I find really fascinating and um, I guess that that would be seen as something that was distinct from from the study of, of fans I mean obviously the you know, definitions of um of fans and fandom are innumerable um, um and and that's why it's such a fascinating area but I think that notion of kind of being a casual mm -hmm. engager with horror I think is is really fascinating and I think just looking at fans would mean that you wouldn't be considering 
those kind of ways in which horror impacts on people and on audiences. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Um, I know I think Matt wanted to come in on this one as well. So I wonder, Matt, if you had particular thoughts on this distinction. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I would absolutely second uh, Kate's sense of um, definitely where we've come from in sort of disciplinary terms about, you know, how we think about audiences as maybe the more casual at the more casual end of of a spectrum of kind of possible forms of engagement and then of course classically uh, fans have been distinguished and, and set apart or you know set aside uh, in terms of their textual productivity um, so that, and that was you know one of the very early that was John Fisk's kind of 1992 year zero in fan studies that was you know what fans did that that meant they weren't just audiences or kind of you know ordinary or more ordinary audiences so I think that is vital but I guess what I would want to suggest partly as a provocation uh, and so you know why not is I think we've got our disciplinary identities that have been organised around audience studies and fan studies. But I think increasingly, if we're in the 21st century, we're dealing with platformization uh, of audiencing. Uh, we're dealing with vast kind of paratextual proliferations, whether you're an audience or a fan, in scare quotes. Um, almost everybody is engaged at some level with forms of textual productivity. They might not all be writing uh, Michael Myers fanfic, but they'll be um, they'll be engaged in some level of even if it's just kind of making short comments on threads on a Facebook, you know, or on a Facebook group or something. So I think increasingly. Although audiences and fans are important to us for historical reasons and for reasons of job titles and, and where we work and what we do and, and academic communities, I think there's quite a significant um, ongoing self deconstruction, uh, really, of those categories where people like Marika Jenner will talk about Netflix audiences and their fan like behaviour, for example. Um, mm. The big fandom will talk about a more general fanization across all of culture. So it's almost like more of us might be fan like more of the time. But as James said, a fan identity can be so varied and non monolithic um, that I have students, um, you know, on a horror module who will say, yeah, we're fan, we're fans, but they will really be fans of maybe one wave of slasher films or fans of one remake and they won't necessarily have watched an original um even you know they'll be like no i'm i'm i saw this film and i'm a fan of this so we might have people who would self-describe as fans who we would might analytically theorize as more casual uh in their engagement but they will still through fanization say yeah we're fans of this and that's part of their identity and they're using social media and performing that in certain ways so it's like audiences are moving closer to fan like and fan practices and there are sections at least of fandom that are probably moving in the other direction so i think um, quite apart from lots of other issues to do with um, certain forms of blindness or gaps in fan studies and um, needing more audience studies, we're probably in a position where they ask those categories and terms are blurring together like never before. Mm -hmm. So that was that was that's my provocation, or maybe people agree, and then it won't it won't be a provocation. But um, and but at the same time, as I say, I completely accept and um, and agree with Kate's narrative that you know that's how we would tend to sort those things. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to your provocation in a moment, but I just wanted to check if James, did you have anything else you wanted to add to this this kind of particular question? Yeah, I mean, I agree with both Kate and Matt there. I think um, to cite Annette Hill's book on um, watching violence, um, and that was really interesting where she, she speaks to audiences, um, and obviously violence is often a, a strong generic quality of horror. Um, and I think what's interesting from that study was that a range of respondents don't normally watch this type of media, and there might be a range of reasons why they then watch it. Um, it could be because it's in the zeitgeist and lots of people are talking about it. It could be because there are perhaps uh, celebrity star actors in it they want to check out. There could be a host of reasons. So I think 
you know, sometimes there is perhaps the risk of focusing on one audience demographic that we assume that this is people that come into it all the time um, with open arms, but other people might join this for, for other reasons. Um, and, and, and just off the back of what Matt was saying, a lot of my research, um, particularly around, say, quality TV horror, quite often the opening gambit of people online is, oh, I don't normally watch this kind of stuff. Um, and actually, this has pulled me in. This has pulled me in in a different way. So um, they don't necessarily, I, I'd say, identify as a fan. But there are things about these texts. It might be that they've got, you've got a kind of genre hybrid um, media that, that's pulling people in. Um, and I suppose the the other thing as well, Office, is fans, or, or sometimes we quite assume fans then means fandoms that fans quite often, or we often think of them as being part of these communities. And a number of fans themselves aren't part of communities, or they like horror, but they don't feel the necessity to find that niche in offline or online spaces. Um, and again, it's where do those where do the fault lines of, of those kind of identities and those practices and those engagements, um, where do we set them? Um, so I think that's what we wanted in, in, in covering audiences as well. Um, and also in some fan spaces, certain people aren't welcome. Um, so what, what does that mean? You know, with, if we're thinking about this from a critical perspective, the kind of habitus of um, certain fan spaces that where certain audiences don't want to be part of. That's great, thank you. Um, that's a really, really good range of responses. Um, I said I would come back to Matt's provocation. I mean, I suppose my next question was, I was sort of thinking about what you're suggesting about this blurring of fan and audience. And I was, sort of, I was thinking a bit about methodology of how to approach fan and audience research. And when I initially was thinking of this question, I was thinking about them as two distinct disciplines, but I suppose the starting point is thinking, you know, what, how, what problems or issues does this blurring of lines raise for how you approach audience or fan research um, when in this landscape where perhaps those lines are just are, are more complicated? Um, and are there particular and then more broadly, are there particular issues that doing this kind of research around horror audiences? Are there issues of methodology that we need to think of? And I wanted to start with Matt, I guess, in response to what you were saying. So I guess, um, I mean, there's always a couple of sort of key methodological issues uh, that you would kind of start from and, and, you know, and then you'd sort of branch off and kind of um, make certain kind of decisions. But one would be um, sometimes it's figured as kind of audience studies versus reception studies or, or that kind of difference. Are you actually wanting to engage empirically with fans? and or audiences, however you define them? Or are you wanting to track textual or discursive traces uh, of their practices, um, which in itself, you know, might be blurred, because if, even if you're speaking to fans and audiences, you, of course, you generate texts, transcriptions of interviews or survey data that is then uh, managed uh, in specific ways. But I think, yeah, there's there's a sense of what type of engagement do we as researchers uh, either wish to have or need to have with fans or audiences um, and then the kind of key thing that kind of follows on from that and I think it's been referred to already Kate was talking about um, you know hidden kind of fan audiences or marginalized kind of fan audiences or or um, getting to kind of speak to non-fan no, fans and anti-fans conventionally the wisdom says are easier to find but you might find certain versions of fandom and not others more easily um you might find certain versions of anti-fandom more easily um but then how do you and that's probably why we've got a relatively i still think a relatively narrow strand of certain audience and fan identities that are, we need more audience studies and more fan studies even if we agree or disagree with the blurring between them on we need more work on both sides but there's a sense of of who who are we likely to find and then if we um, reflexively are aware of that problem how can we broaden our our trawl our search so can we you know do empirical work on people who um wouldn't say they're anti-fans of horror but maybe are non-fans like they they very rarely watch horror they really don't enjoy it they might watch it socially uh, or they might watch it with certain people periodically um 
but you know how how would we go about finding a reasonable number of those people to interview them maybe because otherwise we've got an assumption and this is a classic martin barker argument we've got an assumption that people don't like horror and that we don't need to talk to them about that that's just obvious it's just nasty and they just don't it's just unpleasant and they don't like it but actually if you can find those people and speak to them you might find all sorts of complex discourses and evaluations and performances of identity um, and where they are imagining a line around horror or where they are, you know, where they're imagining symbolically horror would be acceptable and, and not for them and so on. So I think, yeah, I think the key for me, the key sort of methods questions would be, is it are you thinking about doing audiences or reception? And then it, regardless of that, almost or embedded in that, how are you going to try and find people um, and maybe go beyond you know what might be easier or more visible in terms of audiences and fans and but i do think an overall paratextual approach is incredibly kind of valuable like really trying to sift through a wide range of paratexts which themselves are more available to us as researchers and then you can maybe have a chance of identifying subsets of audiences and fans that you that the literature hasn't really found before oh also one last thing Clearly, it makes a difference what your own identity is, cultural identity and intersectional identity is as a researcher. So it's going to be easier for me to find and speak to certain versions of audiences and fans than others, for sure. And um, so there's also a question about actually one way one it is a methodological issue almost or it's an issue about what gets into the academic canon is we need to work to have as much diversity uh, in terms of researcher identities um, of pe people kind of bringing their um, social networks and their um, social and subcultural capital into their scholarship. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, Kate, did you have anything else you wanted to add to this from your experience of audience research? Um, just just mainly to agree with what Matt said, and, and particularly that last point, um, because, um, you know, I've heard over the years criticisms made of both fan and audience studies um, of, of different kinds, not necessarily confined to thinking about horror. This notion of the, of the kind of the dangers of us ending up just researching ourselves or, or people that are very close to ourselves. So there's, there's always this, this worry that you're basically ultimately going to be polling uh, people who might have the same cultural background as you, obviously the same ethnicity, uh, you know, things of that kind, moving in, in certain circles, um, and that you're not therefore getting access to people who are very, very different and removed from you. And this whole conception of the relationship between the researcher and the researched and and who you are as a researcher ultimately impacting on what you're able to find out and where you're able to find it. So I think it's something that, you know, particularly in terms of what we were talking about at the beginning, where I was saying that we need to start thinking about how the consumption side of horror isn't dominated by white men, uh, that we also, you know, that we need, we need to address that in terms of how, um, who we are as researchers and the limits on us being able to do that. You know, I mean, uh, I was obviously there's a, a conference, a big conference next week at King's on de-westernising horror studies. So this question re relates very much to that, you know, and James and I have discussed this when we've been planning the book. Um, how, how do we begin to research audiences outside of um, the Anglo-American context, let alone a, a, any other kind of marginalised audiences, and it's, it's it's you know people who don't speak English don't speak the same language as us. It's really really tricky, and, and it's important that we're all really mindful of that. I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. James, any final thoughts before we kind of move in a different direction? Uh, just to echo some of those sentiments, um, one of the things I've always found quite interesting, and I think online. Um, social media is is a great place to find a variety of voices and obviously that raises its own kind of issues around analyzing other cultures that perhaps aren't your own and your own kind of um, as, as much as being part of a subculture um, but certainly if you can find different voices online or offline um, how they can challenge some of pre-existing notions around what is championed as cult or 
horror or, or good or bad um and also what's been championed by academia um and the industry itself um you know some of my own research has looked at black audiences who were anti-fans of the walking dead which really challenged the existing critique of quality tv um mm. because they found that the secondary characters were who are black were perpetually being killed off in favor of a, a white lead. And they read that with subtext. Um, they said that was indicative of the way that black men were treated in the US. So they're reading a, an ideological um, uh, sort of deconstruction of that, that you know, the creators aren't necessarily trying to embed within it. Um, and, and it's a very successful show, um, hugely transmedial. Um, and, and they felt that, that them as an audience who want to engage, who want to be fans, who want to be horror fans, that the, the text wasn't allowing them to do that. Um, and then the video games show up and they, and they like that because they're a positive representation. So I think my point there is that by sort of finding these voices, um, and I found these voices largely on blogs um, who, who could write at length um, and, and use kind of netnography um, as a method Mm -hmm. um, and, and look at the kind of digital texts that come with that, like memes, for example, that we had evidence of a particular demographic um, who had a particular reading and response to this media um, that was really culturally contextualized, um, but also really kind of um, suggested an alternative response to The Walking Dead that we hadn't really seen both within mainstream press um, and in, in academia. Yeah. That, excellent. That all sounds really interesting and really useful for a lot of my own thinking about um, audience research and methodology. So thank you. Um, I'm going to open this up a little bit now um, and think about it. And my next question is one which I think everyone's probably going to have an opinion on or have something to say. Um, but I'm going to sort of start, maybe start and bring in um, Pete and Bethan into the discussion now, which would be good. Um, so as it was, as Laura mentioned in the beginning, um, I wrote a book on Near Dark and in, in researching the reception, the critical reception of this film, um, I came across a review by the, the memorable Alexander Walker, um, always had something to say, um, where he, he, he closed his review by saying, to be in an audience that enjoys this would frighten me more than anything in the movie. And I'm sure we've all come across reviews like this, where critics or commentators are basically attacking the genre, seeing that you basically trying to attack the genre through, by attacking the fan of this. And I wondered um, how any of you respond to these kinds of comments. How does your work potentially challenge or confront these assumptions about horror fans that we often see? Do you think there's, you know, it, does your work kind of open up and, and challenge our thinking. So I wonder if maybe we could start with Pete and see if he has thoughts. Like I said, I suspect everyone's got an opinion on this these kinds of responses. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I love that quote, as I love lots of things that Alexander Walker has said, <laughs> that like his entire review of Fight Club is, is incredible. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, so, I mean, it's, it's laughable. It, it makes me laugh because as we all sort of know, maybe anecdotally, but I think it also comes out of audience research is that is that is how wonderful and nice and friendly the <laughs> horror community is kind of known to be. We all know it. We, we've seen it at the Fear 2000 conference. We've seen it at, you know, um, Fright Fest and things. So my my research is is not specifically asking people about horror i'm i'm asking people about their memories of of watching 18 or 15 rated films when they weren't old enough to do that in the 1980s so um but i i sort of like to think of them um it was jeffrey robertson and, and andrew nickel in their in their book on media law said uh, um called children victims of censorship so i i like to think of um, the audience that I'm looking at, particularly as 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 victims, um, essentially that that they're but they're victims of censorship. They're not victims of horror. They're not victims of genre. Um, and and I think that what 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 my research has shown me is that we're you know the, the pleasures of horror are are obviously complex. But but for example. 
children are, are um, I think it was David Buckingham talked about de de delight and distress, this kind of ambiguous response or this, this uh, mixed response. And that's what's coming out again and again. You, you know, children are like adults often, I think, disturbed. Children are often confused by things like sexual violence, for example. Um, so, but there's that that feeling of testing yourself that, that particularly children are doing. There's, there's that element of endurance. And this carries on into adulthood. And, and we see it again and again in, in audiences of horror. So that's that's kind of, uh, yeah, that, that's my thinking. I'll, I'll stop though now. <laughs> no, that's really great. And I'm really excited by that research you're doing in that area because I think it is a way of opening up our thinking about audiences of this area. Um, Bethan, did you have any sort of thoughts about where your, how your research maybe challenges some of these assumptions about fans? Yeah, I mean, I think, like Pete said, it is, it is laughable. Um, and my very sort of like non-academic response is it's ridiculous because, <laughs> you know, it kind of, it, it ascribes to the audience I think it almost goes back to the idea of like media effects. You know, these these people are sitting there and they're just consuming this violence, and that clearly says that there is something wrong with them because they like it. And it's like, well, no, that's a really really simplistic reason. Um, I think what we see with multiple texts, but I think horror particularly is sort of the, the pleasures of being scared. Um, and you know, we can go back to when we were kids, and you know doing trick or treat around Halloween. There's, there's a pleasure in being scared and then realizing that there's nothing to be scared about. But a lot of horror, I think, speaks to kind of cultural concerns and cultural issues. And it goes a lot deeper than just, you know, someone killing all of the blonde girls or something like that. We can see a lot about issues of race and racism. Um, issues around sexism, issues around capitalism. So I think it's really reductive to be like, well, you know, I'd be more scared of the horror audience if I was sitting there watching this film um, than actually perhaps being scared about some of the real life issues that the films are reflecting on. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of my take on it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we've got a lot of things to cover, but does anyone else, Matt, Kate or James, do anyone else want to jump in with something on this particular question before I move on? I knew it. Everyone was going to have a strong opinion. Um, Matt. OK, so I was just going to wind the clock back to Carol J. Clover's work. Uh, Men, Women and Chainsaws, which is still the best book title ever. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact that that, you know, makes an argument that I think is still really important, that it does a bravura kind of close reading uh, of a cycle of films uh, and really kind of, you know, coining the final girl kind of then, you know, get, it's such an amazing reading that it gets taken up by in the industry and by fans and becomes you know, discourse that circulates outside academia. But, you know, Clo Clover's kind of, or one of Clover's key arguments is it's only by paying really close attention to the texts, uh, this kind of follows on from Bethan's point, that you can see not only that they might be subtextual or have cultural politics, but Clover argues that it's the trashiest horror that has the possibility of being more radical, of course. Mm. Um, and that if you're Alexander Walker and you just poo-poo stuff and kind of do an almost kind of distance reading of it and its audiences, like you don't actually engage um, more skillfully and more seriously with it, and um, you're actually missing um, what might be very vital cultural and radical impulses, which I think you know are still present in significant ways in the horror genre. And um, you're um, not only kind of traducing its audience, you're completely missing mm -hmm. um, cultural political complexities. You know, which mm -hmm. you should, as a critic, really be beholden to, paying closer attention to. So you know, I think that's. You know, that's an old classic argument, but there, there's still there's still real mileage in that kind of clover type position, I think. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to cut anyone off now. Kate, would you like to come come in with your? Yeah, I'll just I'll just be quick and, and sort of building on that in some ways and also building on certain things Beth said that that 
kind of logic in the Alexander Wolf quote is the kind of logic that powered a lot of censorship campaigns around horror. Um, and it relates to, you know, obviously Bethan's talking about effects logic, which obviously is, is embedded in, you know, campaigns like the Video Nazis campaign, for instance, and equivalent campaigns in other parts of the world. Um, mm -hmm. But also that, that whole notion of by doing that, by judging the audience rather than the film, it is enabling critics to leapfrog over the, the specifics of the film and any cultural um, insights that the film has in the way that um, Matt and Beth just described. And it allows for the um, quick and efficient demonization of horror through its audiences, you know, and, and to say horror is suspect. We don't need to engage with it. We just need to look at the audiences and who we think the audiences are for these films, pathologize them, stereotype them, and then dismiss them. And potentially as a result, you know, ultimately that kind of logic leads to films being banned. So, you know, conceptions of audiences can have that kind of impact ultimately. They can they can lead to films being removed from, you know, legitimate circulation. So they can there's a lot of a lot at stake in how cultural commentators like Walker um characterize horror audiences yeah. uh, in that way, I think. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, actually, it was a it's a question that I think is yielding lots of really interesting points. James, do you want to have um, final comments on this? Just one just quickly. On? I mean, yeah. I mean, I agree with everyone. And I think one of the things that the quote really kind of misses is that it assumes that all horror fans love all horror, <laughs> and that actually, when we look yeah. at audience research, um, horror fans can be very critical of certain horror makers of certain yeah. cycles um so i think you know it's it's that blanket statement that we are kind of uh, dupes that we will take on any form and ultimately it's talking about genre which itself is a very messy subject i mean violence beyond if if the, if the, if the issue ultimately is around violence then we see violence in lots of other genres and, and non-fiction and, and we don't necessarily see those those same kind of criticisms at those audiences um, so it's really thinking about the kind of active audience and how that that relates to this. So, but yeah, excellent, it's not, it's not snappy. Yeah, excellent. No, that's great. No, that's really good. You know, um, uh, yeah, I knew Alexander Walker would be the a provocation to get lots of useful things out of this. That's good. Um, I'd like to now circle back to a couple of things that's come, a few things that have come up in a couple of the answers and maybe pull them together. Um, partly Kate talking about um, the, the, you know, this, this tree, this perception of audiences kind of all being kind of this one kind of similar group, white men. Um, we've mentioned Bridget Cherry's work, and I guess I wanted to pull this together and think that, you know, historically, there's always been, there have been a lot of assumptions about who watches horror, namely adolescent boys. Bridget Cherry's refusing to refuse to look really challenged, started challenging that by showing, yes, there was, there were these women fans of horror. She did her using doing questionnaires and interviews and challenged that. I have to say, I find often when I'm reading stuff, I still sort of see, I'm quite surprised by scholarship that still seems to kind of fall back on the it's adolescent boys watching horror, which always takes me back. So I guess what my question now is, you know, what um you know, how does audience or how can audience and fan research and how is it challenging that idea, you know, of it being for the boys? And I wonder if there's an opportunity to talk about some of your work where you might be challenging that by showing that it's not just the boys. And I wonder, Bethan, if maybe we could start with you, because I know you're working in this at the moment. Yeah. Um, so the chapter that I'm writing for Kate and James's book is actually looking at tattooed female horror fans. Um, and I'm specifically wanted to look at tattooed women because a I am a tattooed woman who is kind of a horror fan and kind of not thinking about Kate's notion of identity way back at the beginning um and also because both of those communities for want of a better word are generally seen as not being for women so if you've got tattoos if you know if you're a fairly heavily tattooed woman up until fairly recently you'd be sort of questioned like well what what is wrong with you why why have you got all these tattoos you'd be so pretty without them that kind of idea and similarly we've got this ongoing idea that you know 
horror fans are men. If you're a woman and you, you like horror, then there's something wrong with you there, or you're just doing it because your boyfriend likes horror. Um, so I find it really interesting to kind of speak directly to women fans and and work out, you know, why why are they horror fans, but why also are they literally embodying that fandom on themselves? Um, so I've, I've put a, a question in, I've had some really, really interesting results coming back in, and I've had people sharing photos of their tattoos with me, and it's it really runs the gamut. Like, I'm getting people saying, well, I started watching The Addams Family when I was a kid, and I really liked it, which, you know, speaks to ideas of memory and nostalgia and yeah. children's horror, um, and things like, well, yeah, my brother used to watch these really, like, schlocky horror films, and it was, you know, I'd sneak into his room and watch them, and... Um, or people would be like, well, I'm a massive fan of Twin Peaks and someone's got this amazing Twin Peaks leg piece, which is just gorgeous. Um, and I find it interesting because one of the questions that I'm asking is, do you think there is still a stigma? And people have been saying not within the horror community. Everyone in the community has been really receptive. They have really liked my art. You know, they, they get that um, affection for the text what quite often happens outside of the horror community with specific groups of people, namely middle-aged, older, conservative white men and women, that's where the, the kind of criticism comes in. Um, and it's related both to horror as a text and preconceived notions of, of what horror is and who likes it, and also those ideas about women not being, shouldn't be tattooed. Um, so I find that really, really interesting and, and actually going directly to the source, for want of a better word, yeah. um, is really enabling me to like address some of my own preconceptions as well. Um, ideas that I had about what people or what women in the horror fandom might be experiencing, what some of the uh, um, kind of issues might be. And actually they're not coming up in ways that I, I, I thought they might come up. Um, and I think that's really important. Like we, we can challenge our own assumptions as well as dealing directly with people that we haven't perhaps heard from before yeah that was a really yeah. long answer <laughs> no but that's a really good answer it's my opportunity to show off my bat tattoos oh that's cute <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly you know um so I completely identify with that um um uh I I think, like I said, I think a lot of people have a response, but I wondered if Peter, do you want to ha have any thoughts on this one that you wanted to come in with? Uh, the, the, so this is where I have to admit that my research is is doing everything that you guys have been talking about, as in bat my, my research is, I'm, I'm just going to come out and say it's super flawed in that I, <laughs> I looked for 300 questionnaire responses. I wanted to hit that target of 300 responses um i mostly got those responses from twitter um i i got like helen o'hara from empire magazine to retweet my call for papers um and and i was you know hoping for diverse responses i got about 70 percent men um and i would say 95 percent of those men are white um so then I followed it up with interviews. And then with those interviews, I've, I've selected equal amounts of men and women so I can, you know, look into them further and, and you know, hopefully that will help to balance things. But so, so I guess, uh, I mean, being new to audience research, I was just so relieved to get to this 300 questionnaires. I wasn't, I'll be honest, I wasn't thinking about how can I target certain groups of people, which I, I wish I had done now, but um, it's too late for this one. But hopefully in a future study, I, I can get a wider range of responses. But I think what the evidence I've seen so far shows me is that um, it was absolutely, you know, girls, girls and boys in the 1980s were watching horror. Um, there is no sense that, that girls were watching horror less. What I have found is... This te I, I I would argue that um, young boys were talking about horror more. Um, they were they were talking about horror. That they were this this idea of um, gifting that that comes up in, in kind of fan cultures and things. Um, it seems to me that that boys and men are, are much more keen to sort of. Um, 
teach each other about film. I think Kate's work touched on this actually, but the, the, um, in Trash or Treasure and the Video Nasties thing with the, the websites about Video Nasties, there's a, there's a tendency for, for, for men to want to sort of maybe teach each other and be the, the, the kind of mentor, the teacher about horror. Um, so we, we, I see that a lot more in the responses of boys. And, and girls, there's more evidence of them thinking they were alone in watching horror, particularly uh, among their sort of girlfriends. But I don't know if that's just sort of, um, if that's re recycling almost stereotypes, but, but I, I, yeah, that, that's what I'm sort of finding from my research. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's really interesting, kind of different responses. Um, I'm just going to pause. I just noticed my camera's frozen with me and I'm looking very, but I can't hear you all. So I'm just going to leave it. At least I look like I'm thoughtful in this frozen moment. So I'm just going to leave it and not fiddle it and risk losing my connection. Um, so um, I want to, I'm aware of time. So I'm going to kind of move on to um, something that's came up a bit earlier and I just wanted to come back to before I open it to questions from the audience, um, which is this notion of toxic fandom. I mean, toxic fandom comes up um, a lot to in, you know, at the moment. Um, we're seeing it come up across all types of fandoms. And I wondered um, if there's um, how this does or doesn't manifest in horror fandom. You know, is is this kind of new or has this always been there but silent? Um, and I wondered if, again, maybe go back to um, Beth and I think you had some thoughts on this and, and yeah. Yeah, um, so I guess a lot of my research has looked at anti-fandom and toxic fandom. Um, and like, as, as James mentioned, there's, um, well, let me go back a bit. I think the first thing is that horror fandom is such a broad term that we see toxicity and anti-fandom expressed in different ways in different elements of that fandom. So James talked about anti-fandom of The Walking Dead amongst black audiences. Matt's done work on um, anti-fandom of Twilight and Twilight fans by typically male members of the horror fandom. So we see it, I think, expressed in different ways across different elements of the fandom. And I think that's really important to note is not just this one sort of you know, homogenous toxicity that exists. Um, I guess my research has been on horror fandom specifically has been fairly recent. So I can't speak to whether it has gone back a long way. I imagine it probably has just because the nature of people, <laughs> sometimes people aren't the best. Um, but I do think with social media platforms with um, more ways to communicate with and across each other, we start to see it a lot more. Um, and I don't know, I imagine that other people have got thoughts on that as well. Yeah, yes, no, thank you. Um, James, I think you sort of wanted to come in on this one. Yeah, so part of my research has covered this. Um, on the one hand, uh, you know, quite often we're sort of saying how great fan spaces can be for marginalized groups. Um, the Hear a Scream edited collection um, is, a, is a lot of sort of personal stories of different people with different identities there but we do also see uh, toxic um, practices and rhetoric um, so part of my forthcoming book and the chapter that I'm writing for Bethan's edited collection um, really kind of taps into this where we are seeing uh, a pushback against racial diversity um, and part of the toxicity that I look at that is that these aren't um, in sort of QAnon or 4chan spaces. This is on Reddit and Twitter and, and how this manifests and, and how people could be quite brazen in the idea of, of white victimhood um, that reinforces some of these norms. And a lot of it boils down to rationalizing these kind of creating these kind of ethical dynamics of um, authenticity and authenticity being so important for many fans um, and used in lots of debates around things like remakes, for example. So the pushback against um, uh, Bates Motel, uh, changing, uh, you know, the kind of um, iconic woman uh, from being a, a white blonde to uh, a black woman played by Rihanna. And the, the, the kind of um, racist discourse that came from that uh, and the debates around that. So, yeah, there's... Um, there are these pushbacks, I think, and, and horror is, um, is, is 
horror sp fan spaces and some of them are uh, are guilty of this um, and other mm. work has looked at where sometimes where fan or anti-fan criticism has taken place in a fan space mm. that, that if it's not part of the, the habitus or the habitual norms and readings that this is often seen as a challenge to that fan space and to that fandom and people are kind of told to kind of toe the line you know to, mm -hmm. to stop being because you're not making it fun anymore you're making it uh, something else um and again that's important to to look at these other spaces then where those those other audiences and fan members might go where they can they can have these responses um, yeah. excellent thank you um well i've got loads of other questions i can ask because i have loads of things to talk to these people about but i'm aware of time and i'd like to uh invite audience members to put questions in the chat um, if you have questions for the panel, um, this is a good space to do that, um, and I'll read them out for you. So while you're, you know, thinking of those questions, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Pete. Actually, I want a question because you've sort of hint on, uh, or not hinted, you've talked about your research. Um, often when we talk about fan research at the moment, we talk about very much online research, and I guess I wondered, you know, what your research has told us about horror fans or fans of the pre-internet age and how maybe that's different. And while Pete's responding, if people want to put questions in the chat, please do go ahead now. Yeah, so so my research is is all about um, children in the 1980s only, so it's very much pre-internet era. And um, I mean, it's one of the main reasons I've, I've uh, sort of taken on this study because I I wanted to to look at the the sort of the VHS era. So what's interesting, I think, is that um, the 80s is is sort of the beginning of the decade. Um, some of my respondents were lucky enough to get into cinemas, for example, um, when they were underage. Um, so people talk about things like Scala, uh, that all night, all night horror um, screenings at the Scala and things like that. And then it moves forward. And most of my respondents were were doing their underage viewings sort of 1987 to 1990, when obviously VHS has exploded and VHS is in, you know, probably most homes by that point. And then we get this whole, uh, you know, an incredible kind of set of experiences, um, interrupted viewings, um, people being interrupted by parents, people having to watch things on television with the news interrupting it. Um, people not seeing the end of films for months or even years. Um, distorted viewings, people watching films from through the the, the um, like the banisters of their stairs and then through a glass door while their parents were watching things on TV. So I'm fascinated with with all of that and and the sort of um, the distinct spaces of the home and you know th these are all obviously new things with with VHS um, because the the cinema experience was very different and all the things that tie in with that in terms of being able to rewatch things um, and um, you know the, the the kind of coping strategies that go with that the viewing. Uh, the different conditions of reception, watching with parents. Um, the, the One of the amazing things that I've learned about, which maybe everyone here knows about, but I didn't know about until I started this research, was men that came around with vans full of videos. Um, this was incredible to me. I, I cannot believe this was a thing. This this was never in my childhood. So men that came around with, with vans full of videos and they had like maybe some dodgier copies of things below certain sections of the van. Um, so much fascinating stuff. So many people talking about the artwork, um, particular magazines, Fangoria and um, Starburst magazine. Um, all these negotiations around parental permissions and accessibility. I could go on and on, but it, you know, it's it's just the the greatest era to to study. I think in terms of um, view, viewing conditions changing, um, and 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 I want to do a follow up study eventually and and see how young people are are, are watching horror or watching anything uh, that they shouldn't be watching now and how that's changed. So, yeah. That's what I'm getting thank to. you thank you pete you brought back lots of memories of me in my bedroom <laughs> as a child watching 
you know, my little tiny portable black and white television late at night. And this is exactly my experience and where a lot of it comes from. So it, I think it's really rich, exciting st uh, stuff. Um, we have a question from Tristan in the audience um, asking to the panel, um, really interesting points illustrated by Pete around memories and Beth and reflecting cultural concerns. And the question is, is there value here to explore whether fandoms within other countries and their own horror icons have similar foundations, mentioning Coffin Joe in Brazil or Santos in Mexico? So is there value and, and how do we, I suppose, explore the value of exploring fandoms in other countries? And uh, would anyone like to come in on this? It's to the whole panel. Anyone want to jump in first? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah, I mean, long and short of it um, is, and I think particularly where, um, so just to sort of uh, cite Matt's work again, um, and I know it's mentioned in the chat, um, you know, he has that fantastic paper that looks at um, Western fans of, of, of J-horror, of, of, of Ring, and, and how they um, challenge the, the remake. Um, and I just, I would love to a study on Japanese fans of J-horror, you know, to, just to, to see where their relationship is with that that cycle of film, uh, with those kind of things. Um, so if anyone knows anyone wants to do some collaboration. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I think, yeah, it's really, and again, it, it's it's about broadening these understandings of, of horror fans and, and, and horror academia. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Anyone else want to come in on that? Before um, I move on, I mean, I would yeah. definitely say yes. Like, I think all of us were nodding along when you started reading yeah. out that question. Yeah. Um, one thing that I I would I'm particularly interested in would be sort of Welsh horror and Welsh language horror, and because that you know Wales is a part of the UK, obviously, and there are a lot of Welsh speakers, but there are also kind of um, cultural issues and tensions specific to Wales, and I would find. Oh. I think that would be really interesting to look at through the medium of you know, Welsh language horror texts. And are they different to English language horror texts coming out of like the UK and the US? Um, and again, like, I'm not a fluent Welsh speaker. So if anyone wants to do research on that, let me know. But yeah, I, I think I think it is, there's definitely value to looking at other countries and looking at those um, kind of you know cultural politics and tensions and how they are expressed within horror. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, but you raised the important the question that keeps coming back to is it's it's yes we want to engage with these these areas of fandom, but it's also about people coming from those communities who speak the language, who know the culture, you know, and it's always that that tension of if it's not your language, so you know it's it's an issue. So it is about also about you know opening the discipline and and accessing research in other places. Um, we have a question from Reese in the audience um, saying, this has been a really interesting discussion that set my mind going. Um, sorry, hold on. The chat moved. Um, oh, hold on. I lost the question. Where'd it go? There it goes. I have a question about the rise of requels and sequels that play heavily on audience nostalgia, particularly given their prevalence in the horror genre. Feels like there are different levels of fandom at play here, these films developing new fans and courting the older ones. But I wonder, given the use of anecdotal and personal data, whether there's a risk these new films could color or recreate audience perceptions of the originals. So it's a really good question. Who would like to tackle that? So I, I can yeah. have a go at responding yeah. to that. Um, so um, all the way back uh, in The Pleasures of Horror, I actually had a chapter about um, the Scream films um, and how they kind of drew on what I call kind of um, intertextual kind of cultural capital or intertextual subcultural capital so how you could analyze the films in terms of what forms of knowledge they were assuming on the part of imagined audiences um, and I think as we sort of engage with more recent kind of remakes of remakes and recalls uh, and that whole culture there's absolutely a sense in which you could do forms of textual analysis that I think would be very revealing uh, in terms of how the industry and how creatives imagine they are addressing uh, 
um, quite a wide range of, of potential uh, audience kind of interpolated positions or subject positions in that sense. Um, and you could even apply, you know, those, those kinds of concepts of intertextual forms of capital. But going beyond that, I think in terms of if you were going to do audience, empirical audience or fan studies, you would then be interested in what discourses of nostalgia do flesh and blood audiences and, and fans with different levels um, of fan cultural capital draw on? Um, what knowledge do they have of, you know, the whole kind of monopoly of kind of remakes and, and originals and so on? Um, and then how does that kind of lead to probably quite different and in some cases very much industrially unanticipated um, readings. Um, and just to give an example, I mean, I, I have I'd have a number of students, um, and I referred to this earlier because it kind of surprised me, um, who are passionate horror fans and will have watched kind of recent remakes or, you know, with several generations of remakes away from an original, but won't necessarily have felt motivated or any need to go back and watch, um, you know, the original version of, of a particular slasher film. Um, and they'll still be kind of knowledgeable um, horror fans or they'll be passionate kind of um, fans, um, but they they just won't be invested in a kind of traditional um, sense of fan cultural capital where you've got to do your learning and go back and watch the classics and like it's like a curriculum isn't it sometimes mm -hmm. if you've got to go back and watch certain films and and for whatever reason that's kind of passed them by I guess they're, they're not rooted in those um, conventional senses of horror community so maybe they're sharing their fandom through social media but, but not in a way that ties back to you know what fan studies and horror studies would see as and it's probably generational in fact but would see as a certain version of community so i think i absolutely agree with the question you could do some brilliant analysis textually but there's so much more going on i, I would say when you start to dig into the discourses of nostalgia and uh, the discourses of knowledge and um, that a range of audiences and fans are bringing to bear and that for me is why doing whether you call it audience studies or fan studies or some hybrid of the two that's why i love doing this kind of work so much because you know you do you find people discussing texts that you thought you knew um in completely unexpected ways um and it's you know often quite a, an eye-opening and amazing and even you know, transformative kind of experience of like, oh, okay, people are understanding that horror media in that way. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. That is um, a great answer. Um, I have a question now from Laura, uh, responding to what's been said so far, saying the panel have covered quite eloquently the need to be mindful of inclusivity in fan and audience research, both in terms of researchers and subjects. And I wonder if you have any examples of studies which are exemplary in this regard, or is there a real gap? Relatedly, I wonder if the panel might talk a bit about methodology in terms of broadening who these studies reach, how can we as researchers find those audiences? So who would like to come in on that one? It's a two-part question, I suppose. Are there any exemplary works out there of people, to, you know, reaching could these I, gaps? Could I yeah. just say, so, so this isn't specific to horror, and I can't give you um, exemplary studies, but I've been doing a, a podcast with the the audience project, the the research network at Oxford Brooks, um, and, and and we're always looking at audiences, and we're we're trying to find as diverse a range of possible of, of researchers to talk to about their audience studies and their methodologies and things. And we've spoken to quite a few um, researchers that have talked about, and, and, and I don't know how I feel about it because it, 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 it saddens me to think that you might need this, but they've talked about sort of, I think the word they used was mediators, uh, as in, so if you're trying to reach out to a, a you know, a particular community, you, you have a, you have a mediator um, who, who sort of helps you to, put, helps put you in touch with a community or whatever. So that, that's the only thing I can kind of offer in the way of um, what I've, I've heard of other researchers doing, but I don't know how useful that yeah. is. No, that's that's really interesting. I've never heard of that. So that sounds really interesting um, and very useful. Bethan, did you have 
Um, I, yeah, I, I was going to mention Martin Barker, um, particularly like the, the really large scale research projects um, that he's done. The, the latest was on Game of Thrones audiences. Um, mm -hmm. And the book has been published with Clarissa Smith and Fiona Atwood. And there's a, an entire chapter, like the whole book could just talk about the methodology. There's a chapter dedicated to the methodology. Um, and they had something like three million words of responses across the globe. Um, so I, I definitely recommend reading that. Thank you. Excellent. That's really helpful. And we knew it would come back to Martin at some point or other, and he has a few times tonight. Um, we have a question from Noel asking, um, thanks everyone for loads to chew on here. Question for the panel, I'm particularly interested in how film marketing has changed, changed in terms of platforms over the years, but how so many of its approaches or tricks stay the same, particularly in horror. Compared to traditional channels, it seems streaming sites like Netflix have a lot more skin in the word of mouth game. And I wonder, would that also extend to fandoms as a result? So I think that's a really interesting thing about marketing and fandom and audiences. Who would anyone like to anyone have thoughts on that? Uh, James? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, I think that's a really good point is that, again, if we're looking at fans as authentic audiences, you know, the, the word of mouth and if they are bastions of these texts, then that can go a long way. Um, and, you know, the kind of viral marketing. Um, but again, this can be really interesting for, for audience research to look at how our audience is responding to the marketing of texts and how do they play a part in shaping the kind of paratextual nexus around things. Um, and all the things we've talked about today um, can be flagged up in terms of marketing, um, whether it be that we are uh, championing a, a requel or, or, or not, as the case may be, um, that we are um, unhappy with representations, even at a trailer's <laughs> level. Um, I saw stuff today where fans were already unhappy about there being a new Jeepers Creepers um, because of the previous director and his ability to work in the industry, just, you know, despite his criminal past. Um, and all of that comes from not even watching a film. That comes from the the, the marketing that's coming before that. So I definitely think there is the, um, and the fan productivity that might come with that, that fans might, might you know, rewrite trailers um, or they might uh, you know, take that marketing material, turn it into memes to subvert the meaning. Um, and so it's a really, um, if we're thinking about spaces for audience research and fan studies, um, marketing and paratextual work, I, I think that, that there needs to be more in that area particularly around say fan responses to so say trailers or, or, or those kind of things yeah um, and shameless promotion we have got some work on that in the book haven't we James that, that that's doing that very thing it's thinking about rework trailers as as a as as fan labor as as kind of fan response to horror excellent excellent um well, there's probably a chance if someone wants to get a quick question in the chat, um, there's probably time for one more question. And Christy got in there quickly. Excellent. Um, so Christy says, I'm thinking about the different threads in this discussion, fandom and toxic fandom, the lack of interest in older versions of remakes, backlash on progressive films, and can't help but think of the reception to the Hellraiser movie, especially in the lack of understanding the queer history of the film. Does anyone on the panel have any thoughts on this? I think that's a great question. And I think it's the the amount of discussion that's come out of that before it even being aired um, and how we are getting certain fans um, of certain identity identities really championing this and saying this is amazing. And then you have other people saying that this is inauthentic, that this is pandering, that this is woke. Um, and... I think what's interesting about that is that we are seeing wider cultural language or horror and ho horror audiences operating in a cultural climate that we can't divorce it from. You know, horror fans, horror audiences um, don't live in a vacuum. Um, they have identities outside of being fans or they are influenced perhaps by their political identities, 
Um, so I think that uh, Hellraiser is a, is a really good um, case study or a, a case in point of, of, of some of these things that you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think we're getting close to the end and unless there's any last questions to the audience, I'm going to end with my kind of final question, which I think we've kind of hit on. We've talked about lots of things, lots of key areas of work, um, identified some areas that need to work. But I guess my last question for everyone on the panel um, or anyone who wants to respond is, you know, having, you know, done extensive work around horror fandom and audiences are there particular gaps in research that you think should be addressed in future scholarship you know what would you be encouraging you know um yeah current scholars to be thinking horror scholars to be thinking about doing it to doing and approaching in um this area um so matt did you want to come in on this one uh, yeah, so um, just to be brief, because we're nearly at the end of the session, I think if we're if we were particularly considering 21st century, you know, contemporary horror fandom, um, and I think it's been implicit in some things that uh, a number of people have said, um, and in, in James's answer just now, I would encourage people to do work on platformization of horror fandom and its datification you know like what happens if um fans subcultural capital or uh, fan cultural capital uh is kind of integrated into corporate um circuits of datification or is kind of um catered to by um algorithmic culture in certain ways so you get an uncanny doubling of fandom where netflix seems to be recognizing something about your fan tastes or but maybe not quite recognizing your fan tastes but but close enough so i think that that side um we've maybe spoken less explicitly about it but that side of a kind of um corporatization neoliberalization uh of horror fandom that all feeds into the discourses that are the entitlement that, that are linked to um, performances of toxic fandom and those kind of wider contexts I think are important. Thank you. Any other, thank you, that's a really great response. Any other responses or thoughts in different areas of research, Kate? Yeah, just to sort of balance Matt, I guess, because Matt, Matt was focusing on a kind of very contemporary area of inquiry and sort of shamelessly going back to the past and thinking about kind of historical approaches, you know, and building on what Pete said as well. I think there's still an enormous amount to, of work to do on, on the history of horror audiences and fandom. So we can actually contextualize some of the, the, the things that we've been talking about. So for instance, you know, when Pete was saying that in his memory research, it's become apparent there that, you know, um, women are watching horror in the eighties just as much as, as, as men. Um, I mean, the, the other thing I felt I've been doing um, research on ghost watch and people's memories of ghost watch. Um, mm -hmm. And the and this is this is a pattern that I'd be interested to know this is true for Pete as well. Uh, and also in Lauren Shelley's research and um, mothers, you know, that, that mums are often these figures in these memories who are not just sort of um, regulators sending children, to, young people to bed or anything like that. Often they're passing on their horror fandom to their children. They're the gatekeepers, yeah. which is suggesting that, for instance, female fans in, in, in horror has a long, long history, yeah. that perhaps that kind of memory research is, is our best way of trying to uncover that, that actually there's this hidden history of, of female fans in, within horror that, that goes back a very, very long way in a couple of generations. So I think going back into the past and thinking about the legacy um, of different kinds of horror fandoms and different kinds of gatekeepers who passed on their horror fandom to their children is also something that I, I think it'd be great to have more research on that. Excellent, excellent. James? Just off the back of that and, and maybe trying to find a, a happy medium between these two, two points um, <laughs> <laughs> um, is um, I think uh, looking at different sites of consumption of, of, of uh, horror media um, mm. and thinking about those new sites, um, Emma Pett's book on experiential cinema and immersion, um, which often are about nostalgia and memory. Um, and you know, kind of what Pete's saying as well that you know, looking at different sites of where you know a rural screening of a horror film is very, very different than watching it in a multiplex. And I think again, if we're thinking about audience response and the kind of 
the variety. Um, I think sight and space has a really important role in that. So branching out and finding these different spaces um, and the kind of memories they might evoke or the kind of, as we say, the kind of the industry that are trying to tap into this and monetize it, um, I think is is very interesting uh, point, of, a point of research. Yeah, absolutely. And um, with that in mind, I called to mind that I did a, a virtual reality zombie hunt game last night. And that is a very interesting audience reaction and audience engagement with horror in a very different kind of site and location. So I highly recommend trying that experience. Um, well, thank you all. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for um, an outstanding discussion about audiences and fandom in horror. Um, I've learned a lot and I think our panel, our audience has as well. Um, I wish, I want to wish Kate and James a lot of luck with the new book. It's really exciting. And I think we're all looking forward to, I mean, some of you are working or in it or busy writing your pieces, but some of us are just looking forward to reading it. So um, I'd like to thank um, the Bass Horror Sig for organizing this event and for inviting such an illustrious panel together to talk to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank and thanks, you, everybody. thanks for chairing. Thanks for chairing, Stacey. Yeah, thanks Thank very you, much. Stacey. Thank you. Job. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to see everybody. Yes. Yeah, lovely to Thank see you. everyone. Good job.